Hello and welcome. We are the 3 Avian Sabbath School panel. We are going to study a lesson that is going to be a great, great lesson. Let me tell you again what the title of that lesson is, Waiting in the Crucible, lesson number 11. And so far we have had wonderful, spiritually uplifting lessons in this quarterly because it's all about facing trials, facing difficulties, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let me introduce to you the family that is with us, uh, our Bible students that God has blessed with a message for us today. To my left, Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor Denzi. I have Monday in God's time. Amen. Sister Shelley Quinn, you are here as well. I, I hope so. <laughs> I, mine is called David, an object lesson in waiting. Mm. Amen. Mm -hmm. We have Pastor Ryan Day. Welcome. It's always a blessing to be a part of the panel, and I'm going to be talking about Elijah and the problem of rushing. Oh, it's going to be interesting. Also, we have Pastor James Rafferty. Welcome as well. Good to be here, John. I have Thursday's lesson, which is learning to take delight in the Lord. Mm -hmm. amen, amen, amen. Would you kindly lead us in prayer, please? Yes, let's pray. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for blessing us with this uh, Sabbath School, Adult Sabbath School lesson. So far, we are just thrilled to be part of learning how to mm. be in the crucible with you. Uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide each one of us and the hearts of the viewers and ask that you'll just bless the reading and the studying of your word right now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Well, let's begin our lesson. And I'm going to read to you the memory text. It's taken from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. <laughs> wow. And now we want to uh, tell you about a story here. The lesson brings out a story about some marshmallows, but I have also seen some videos of children that went to a similar test. Mm -hmm. And they, the parents put the child in, front, in a table, nothing else on the table, and put some candy or some cookies in front of them. He says, wait until I get back, don't eat any. And the <laughs> parent goes away, the camera's on the child, and the child is uh, looking at them, looking to see when mommy or daddy's coming back, <laughs> and they touch them, but, and, and some of them could not resist. Uh, and they hear a voice, don't eat any, and mm-hmm, <laughs> and they were eating. And so, uh, also seen some videos of some dogs where they're serving their food, and, they, and they're making them wait, and the dog is just salivating, salivating. And it's difficult to wait, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to wait. Now, the lesson brings out that they have done a scientific test on children, and they told some to wait, and if they waited uh, and don't eat the one marshmallow, they will get two later. And some children could not resist, and some did. And so the study says that they had found that those that waited, they were the ones that were more confident, they were the ones that were better students, and they were the ones that were able to face life better than the others that couldn't wait, and they just have to have their marshmallow right now. <laughs> so there are uh, some principles and some blessings that we can see that there is a blessing in waiting and scientifically proven as well. So let's go into lesson uh, for Sunday, the God of patience. In this lesson, we're gonna take a look at Romans chapter 15 and beginning in verse four, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, mm -hmm. that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So all those things that you see the people of Israel going through and the servants of the Lord going through, they are written for our learning so that we can have hope. Verse five says, now may the God of patience mm -hmm. and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So God is a God of patience. God is a God of comfort. And I believe that you, are grateful as I am that God is patient with mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. He right. has uh, worked with us and we fall over and over again, but He patiently yeah. calls us to repentance, calls us to come to Him, calls us to Him so that we can repent, so that we can follow Him. And He is merciful and I am grateful for His mercy. Mm -hmm. The lesson brings this out that I would like to read to you. We are normally impatient about things that we really want or have been promised but don't have it yet. We are often satisfied only when we get 
what we are waiting for. And because we rarely get what we want, when we want it, it means that we are often doomed to irritation and impatience. We do live in a world where people want things right away. You can go through a drive through and get your lunch pretty fast. You can go to a teller machine and get your money out right away. You can even, if you're hungry, don't have to wait for somebody cooking it or you cooking it. You can go to your freezer, most homes, and get yourself a pre-cooked dinner, put it in a, not a regular oven, a microwave oven, and quickly you have something ready to eat. Mm. We are people that want things done right away. But there are some things in, in life that we have to wait for. And I remember one time when I was um, looking for a job, I was studying, and uh, I wanted a job that allowed me to be faithful to the Lord in keeping the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And I looked and I looked, and I remember at the school, they would post jobs, and I would look there to see what the days were that, you, that they were looking for people to work in, and job after job uh, didn't seem to fit what I needed, and some did, and sometimes I look in the newspaper and I say, okay, let me go here. Interviewed many times, and yes, just one day, I, just, I would always tell them, I would like to let you know that I am not able to work from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, any other time of the week, I am willing to work. Uh, oh, no, 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 we, we need you to work Friday night, so we need you to work on Saturday. So it took a while for me to find a job, and I was praying to the Lord, Lord, bless me, bless me with a job. And there on the bulletin board, there it was. They're looking for workers at the Federal Reserve Bank, and they're looking for people to work from Sunday hmm. through Thursday. I said, wait a minute, this can't be true. Is it true? <laughs> and I looked there, and yes, it was. I said, that's perfect. It's, it, this is the job for me. So I went to get interviewed, and of course, you go through the process, and now you got to wait to see if you're going to get hired. And I was praying to the Lord, and I remember the pastor that I put as a reference there when I saw him on Saturday, did you get the job? I said, uh, no, not yet. Oh man, with the reference I gave you, they should make you vice president. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yeah, I put in a really good word for you. I said, thank you, I really appreciate it. Well, on Monday they called me and uh, I can tell you that it was worth waiting for. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there was any better job in Chicago at that time. It was perfect for me. The, 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 the amount of money I was paid and the benefits were wonderful. I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank in downtown and it was a, a great learning experience as well. If we wait on the Lord, we will see that He will bless us. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Psalm 27 mm -hmm. and verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage and He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Now, who is talking here? This is David. Mm -hmm. This is David that was anointed king, and it took a great while for him to get to the throne. It was almost 10 years that the Lord anointed, that he was anointed by the prophet Samuel. Mm -hmm. It was almost 10 years, and he waited on the Lord, and the Lord put him on the throne, and it was the perfect time. David was ready. David had learned many lessons from the Lord, and depending on the Lord, he was able to lead the people of Israel in a marvelous way. And so, uh, I, would, I would like to bring you to Psalm 121. This is one of my favorite Psalms. And uh, it talks about where the blessing comes from. Notice, beginning in verse one, I will lift up my, lift up my eyes to the hills. Yeah. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Mm -hmm. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Praise be to his name. This is God. This mm -hmm. is the God that we serve. This Amen. is the, the God that we should wait on because mm -hmm. he is going to come through for us. And I encourage you to wait on the Lord. And this is again, this is David talking. He's, uh, and he says, be of good courage and he will bless you. In Psalm 37, there's another uh, verse that we'd like to bring to you. Psalm 37, verse 7, it says, 
rest in the Lord. <laughs> so while we're waiting, we can rest in the Lord mm. and wait patiently for Him. And now this is one that is difficult for us. It says, do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Mm. I have a brother that lives in New Jersey and he's been waiting for something for a long time. Now he has uh, been waiting for, uh, for this for quite a while. And he says to me, I don't understand. There are some people that have done things uh, unlawfully and they have received what they wanted and they have uh, their wife and their children with them. And I've been waiting and waiting for years and nothing has happened for me. Mm. And so I continue to encourage him, wait on the Lord, do things the right way because the Lord will bless those that do things the right way. Just continue waiting on the Lord. And he's encouraged and he waits. Mm -hmm. And then there are those moments we become impatient because it seems to take longer mm -hmm. than we think it should. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you know, the Lord's timing is perfect. Amen. The Lord's timing is perfect. Let's go to Psalms 40 verses uh, 1 through 5. Psalms 40 verses 1 through 5. Notice what David says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song, Pastor Ryan, a new song <laughs> right. in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and I will trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man and woman who <laughs> makes the Lord his trust and will and makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Mm. Many, many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works mm. which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. The Lord is mm. good, and he mm. knows what is best for us. The time of waiting can be difficult. The time of waiting can bring some discouragement, but we need to hang on, mm -hmm. trust in the promises of the Lord. You know, the Bible says that there's a declaration, I can't remember where it is now, I didn't think of sharing this, but it says, uh, I think it's in First Chronicles, it says, all the promises of the Lord, everything mm -hmm. that He has promised has been accomplished. Yes. The Lord is good. The Lord is marvelous. Mm -hmm. I need to read quick, quickly Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces uh, perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. Waiting, that is not an easy thing for me. My name is Jill Morricone. I have Monday's lesson, which is in God's time. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the timing of Christ's first coming. And then we're going to look at how are we as Christians in these last days to wait? What are we to do when we're waiting for the answers to our prayer to come forth? I've divided the lesson into three sections. First section is what is God's timing? Second is why does he choose the time that he does? And that we really don't have a full answer for. The third section I think is the most important is how do we wait? What are we to do during that waiting time? So let's look at the first section. What is God's timing? For that, we're going to Romans. Romans chapter five, we're gonna pick it up in verse six. When we were still without strength, literally when we were still dead in trespasses and sins, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does that mean? Was there a time appointed for Christ to die? Absolutely. Go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter four, I love this passage. Verse four, when the fullness of time had come, this means according to God's timetable, according to God's calendar, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law or under the curse of the law. Why? To redeem you and I who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, that we might become Abraham's children and heirs according to the promise. Let's look at this time prophecy for when Jesus was scheduled to come and be born and die. 
be our Messiah. We're going to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9. Now remember Daniel 9, Daniel 8 ended with Daniel fainting with that vision, the 2300 days with Daniel 8, 14. And then Daniel 9 opens Daniel this incredible prayer. I actually like Daniel 9, mm -hmm. Nehemiah 9, and Ezra 9. Mm -hmm. They're all prayers, mm -hmm. fasting, confession of sin, but we're not going there. Let's jump over to verse 24. Gabriel comes, of course, and answered to Daniel's prayer. And we see this answer, Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now, we don't have time to get into an extensive study here at this moment. But we know that word determined means cut off, meaning the 70 weeks, if you multiply 70 times 7, you come up with 490. We know that the 490 years was cut off from that larger 2300 day prophecy. They both started at the same time, but the 490 went a certain place and it stopped, while the 2300 kept going all the way down to the end. And what was the purpose of these 70 weeks? You can see three evils and three good things to come. What was it? To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, which the Lord Jesus did for us. I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ reconciling, there's that word, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. And then what are the good things that come? To bring in everlasting righteousness, mm -hmm. to seal up the vision and the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. But when does this 490 year prophecy begin? The next verse tells us, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, the anointed one, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Mm -hmm. So when was the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? If you study that, this was issued by Artaxerxes I, Ezra's return to Jerusalem. This is 457 BC. And if you count that time period, 69 weeks forward, we come when? To Jesus, that's right, AD 27, mm -hmm. Jesus' baptism. Mm -hmm. That's right, that is the 483 years period. Mm -hmm. This is the 69 weeks we come to Jesus' baptism. Well, it's incredible to me that 500 years, basically, before Jesus was to come, God predicted it through the prophet Daniel. 500 years in advance, mm -hmm. Messiah the Prince is coming. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming. And we see that he was cut off in the middle, meaning the crucifixion happens in the middle of that week time period. Of course, baptism of Jesus is in the fall of AD 27. And then the crucifixions in the spring of AD 31. And what happened at that time? He died for our sins. He confirmed the covenant with many for one week, but it was cut off. The veil of the temple was torn asunder, mm -hmm. as it were, bringing an end to the sacrifice. Why does he choose the time he comes? Why did Jesus come at that time? Mm -hmm. I can't understand the mind of God. And the lesson brought this out. Um, why did he seemingly can't wait to deal with sin? There were thousands of years, right? From Adam and Eve when they first stepped into sin until we come down to this time. And you and I could ask that question today. Why does it appear that Jesus is waiting to come the second mm -hmm. time? We know no man knows the day nor the hour. There's not a time prophecy for when he comes the second time. But still, why is he waiting? I think about Abraham and Sarah waiting for a son. Elijah waiting for the rain to come. You might be saying, why is the Lord waiting so long to answer my prayer? Mm. You know, I was thinking, Ryan, you referenced in an earlier lesson that you don't like to wait. I don't like to wait either. Mm. They say on average, people wait 15 minutes for a table at a restaurant, 20 minutes a day for the bus, 32 minutes at the doctor's office, 28 minutes in security lines when you're traveling, 13 hours annually on hold for customer service. That has got to be the most frustrating mm. ever. Mm. Now, those are trivial things. You could say those are first world problems. But what about serious problems? We wait for the result of the biopsy, do we not? We wait for the door to open for the job you always wanted or the home you mm -hmm. want or the ministry you want God to open for you. You might be waiting for God to provide a friend or a spouse or a mm -hmm. child or a soulmate. We wait, really, because we don't have any answer. We don't have any choice. We can't fix the problem. We're incapable of changing our circumstances. 
I think the most important thing is the final section of our lesson is how do we wait? We all have times of waiting. We all have times where we endure the crucible of waiting. But how do we wait? I think there's three keys in how to wait. Key number one, we wait and surrender. We wait in submission to the will of God. It makes all the difference in how you wait. You can wait fighting. You can wait antsy. You can wait, God, I don't know what you're doing. Or you can surrender to God's will. Mm -hmm. Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Yea, your law is within my heart. We can't delight to do his will if we don't know him. Mm -hmm. Isn't that true? John 17, 3, this is life eternal, that they may know you. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. If you know someone, you delight in them. If you know someone, you want to please them. If you know someone, it's much easier to surrender. So the key is when we are waiting, waiting and surrender and submission to his will, yes, that's vitally important, but you have to know him if you're gonna to surrender to him. Mm -hmm. You have to know him if you're gonna to submit to him. Right. The second key to waiting is we wait in active service not in idleness or discouragement. Do you know, we could sit at home and mope. We could wait in self-pity. We could wait and whine and complain, or we can wait in active service. Hmm. Luke 19, verse 13, Jesus said, occupy until I come. Amen. I love Galatians 6, verse 9. In the New Living Translation, it says, don't be tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if you do not give up. So instead of waiting and moping, <clears throat> waiting in self-pity, seek out other people. Mm. Serve with joy. Do the next thing, whatever God puts in your path, mm -hmm. occupy while you're in that waiting time. Finally, number three, when we wait, we wait in eager anticipation, mm. eager expectation of what God is going to do in our lives. And I'm going to repeat what Pastor Johnny read, Romans 5. I love this passage, 3 through 5. We glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Mm -hmm. That word perseverance in Greek comes from two words. One is under mm -hmm. and the other is remaining or enduring. So literally it means we remain under. Mm -hmm. We endure underneath. That is the waiting time. That is the crucible, remaining mm -hmm. underneath. And what happens? That produces character. And character, it produces hope or eager expectation. Mm -hmm. So we wait when we don't want to wait. We wait in eager expectation that this crucible is not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. That God has a future and a hope for our lives. Right. And that you can look forward with eager anticipation to what he has in mind for you next. Hey. Amen. 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 Well, the verse I was referring to before, Joshua 21, 45, not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord has spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. We are studying, waiting in the crucible, and we will continue in a moment. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 abnsabbathschoolpanelcom a clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. I hope you have a quarterly to follow along. We are back and we continue with Sister Shelley Quinn. Oh, thank you. I'm Shelley Quinn and my lesson Tuesday is David an object lesson in waiting. Mm -hmm. You know, King Saul was such a disappointment as a king mm -hmm. because he never followed what the Lord said and he had an unbalanced emotional state of mm -hmm. being. So when Samuel was sent, the prophet Samuel was sent to anoint a new king, he was afraid of mm -hmm. Saul's reprisal, mm -hmm. but he goes to the house of Jesse and God had chosen the youngest of Jesse's sons. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking that David, who was a little shepherd boy out there, was probably middle teens, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Probably. And did you know what? He anoints Saul, I mean Samuel, prophet Samuel, 
anoints this young teenager as king. David was anointed three times. Mm. Once in front of his family, once in front of his tribe of Judah, and then once in front of the nation of Israel mm. when he finally became king at the age of 30. Mm. So we're looking at like a 15 year span mm. from the time he was first anointed till this actually came about. You talk about an object lesson in waiting. <laughs> David can teach us some things. So what happens? Because David, when he was young, he had these great musical abilities. He was called to play for mm -hmm. King Saul, mm -hmm. to soothe his psychological, emotional problems. And then he killed Goliath, became a national hero. Saul knew that David was destined to be the next king. Saul hated David and mm. he made it his purpose mm. to try to kill him. So David spends many years running for his life, hiding in the desert. But here's what our quarterly says. David does nothing to advance his God-given destiny. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? David did nothing to advance his God-given destiny, destiny. Even when Saul tried to kill him and David snipped a piece of cloth off the king's robe, he wished he'd never done such a thing. That happens mm -hmm. in 1 Samuel 24. But now... Let's go to 1 Samuel 26 because here it comes again. What happened? I'm just going to kind of recap this. In 1 Samuel 26, 1 through 7, David is betrayed by the men of Zip. They tell mm. King Saul where, he's, where David is hiding. Mm. Saul chooses an elite guard of 3,000 men, soldiers to go with him, and he is after David in the wilderness of Zip. And so what Saul does is he chooses a high ground thinking that this is going to provide him better protection. But David, led by the Lord, chooses an even higher ground where he can look down at Saul's camp. There's Saul feeling invulnerable. <laughs> He's sleeping. He's in the middle. Picture this camp. Here's King Saul his captain Abner's next to him. King Saul sitting there with a spear in the ground, <laughs> jug of water by his head, and all the rest of his 3,000 men are camped around him. He thought nobody can mm -hmm. get to him. <laughs> so what happens, God put the whole camp into a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. And so as they're sleeping, David and Abishai, one of his men, go down to the camp Here's 1 Samuel 26. We'll begin with verse 8. Ab Abishai says to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once <laughs> with a sphere right to the earth. And I will not have to strike him a second time. Mm -hmm. Let me take my spear. I'll get rid of him. <laughs> but what does David say to Abishai? Mm. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Then David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, boy, that's a solemn life or death oath. Mm. He said, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him or his day shall come to die or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but please, Take the spear that's by his head. Take the jug of water and let us go. Mm. So Abishai, he's only trying to protect his leader. He knows Saul's trying to kill David. But he gives advice that seems reasonable, but it's against God's moral standards. Yeah. And here's the beautiful thing. David had already decided in his heart that he was not going to challenge God's sovereignty. He was not going to take matters into his own hand. Mm -hmm. He was going to leave Saul's life in the Lord's hands. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you three takeaways just from this part of the lesson. We must determine in our hearts to follow the Lord. Mm -hmm. Justice belongs to God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's so important. That's Number two, if a friend counsels us with what sounds reasonable according to the world system. Let us always keep God's commandments as our guiding rule.
And number three, don't run ahead of God's timing. Those are mm -hmm. great lessons right. that David teaches us. Now you go on in verse 12, 1 Samuel 26, 12 through, through 25. David is now, he's gone back up and he's at a safe distance from Saul. I find this interesting. He calls out to the king, woohoo, Saul, wake up. <laughs> and he says, I've got your spear. I've got your jug that were right by your head. And this is evidence that David had been so close to Saul <laughs> mm -hmm. that he could have taken his life, but David was loyal and it exposes <laughs> to Saul how vulnerable he, vulnerable he mm. had been. And then David proposes two reasons why Saul might be trying to keep him, kill him. Either David had sinned against the Lord and in that case he said that, hey, I'll, I'll sacrifice for atonement or evil men were lying and stirring up Saul's hostility, in which case David says they should mm -hmm. be judged. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love it because David suggests, hey, you're running around out in the desert after me. I'm nothing but a worthless flea. Mm -hmm. And he just basically <laughs> telling Saul, your pursuit of me is a waste of time and resources. Mm -hmm. So let's look at verse 21, 1 Samuel 26, 21. When Saul Here's David up a little higher than him, hollering down to him. Saul sees what's happened. He realized how vulnerable, vulnerable he was mm -hmm. and how loyal David had been. Saul said, I have sinned. Return my son, David, for I will harm you no more because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Well, it sounds pretty repentant, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. But you know what? David knew Saul's past actions mm -hmm. couldn't be trusted mm -hmm. and he wisely refused the invitation to mm -hmm. return to Saul. In fact, what he does is he tactfully suggests that Saul send a young man to come get the, the, the spear. In 1 Samuel 26, 24, David mm -hmm. says, Indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes. He's saying to King Saul, I valued your life in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But he, David says, get this, so let my life <laughs> be valued much, not in Saul's eyes, but in the eyes mm -hmm. of the Lord. Yeah, that's Amen. good. Let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all of this tribulation. Mm -hmm. And Saul says to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall do both do great things and also still prevail. David went on his way. Saul went on his way. Mm -hmm. This was the last time mm -hmm. they ever exchanged words. Mm. And Saul admits that God's got great plans for David, his son-in-law, who was going to be the future king of, of Israel. And he knew God was protecting him. And you know what's interesting? Every time David came in contact with Saul, he was very generous toward his enemy. Mm. Mm. And here is what the takeaways that I want to give you. Don't, first takeaway, don't worry if others consider your life valuable. God does. Amen. God says you are worth nothing less than the price he paid for you mm -hmm. with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. The second is show kindness to your enemies because you heap burning coals on their head, which it's an act of repentance. Sometimes when you're kind to your enemies, they repent. Mm -hmm. And number three, forgive, but don't go back down to the camp. Don't trust your enemy mm -hmm. unless true actions of repentance have been shown. Mm. Amen. Amen. All right. On that note, Wednesday's lesson, I'm Ryan Day, and I have Elijah, the problem of rushing. 
So obviously we want to wait on the Lord. We want to make sure that we are working in God's perfect timing. But as we have, as has been clearly brought out many times already, that many times we may find ourselves in a situation where we are not waiting on God's perfect timing and we tend to rush things. And so the lesson brings out Elijah as an example in this. And uh, we're not going to read all of the story, but basically uh, in the uh, in the aftermath of the great showdown on Mount Carmel, we see that the false prophets have been killed and God's name and character has been vindicated. And now Jezebel has heard about all this and she issues a message to, to Elijah and it sparks some fear in Elijah's heart. And so uh, here, here it is. Let's go right to, uh, we're in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 9 is what we're going to be reading. Um, I think it's verses 1 through 9. Uh, yes, verses 1 through 9. Uh, this is 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to start with verse 1. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, this is, you know, I, can't, I cannot necessarily throw darts here at Elijah and say, what are you thinking of, you know, because oftentimes we, we often, we, we do the same thing. God has just shown out in such a powerful way mm -hmm. to build our faith and remind us that he's leading, that he's there. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the same time though, I have to look at Elijah and say, brother, <laughs> did you, have you forgotten so soon what God just did for you atop of that mountain? He just rained fire down from heaven and, you know, he's used you in a mighty way. Uh, and, and yet in this moment when the queen, this evil queen issues a threat against your life, it's almost like he forgets for a moment to turn to God and go, uh, Lord, what should I do at this moment? Uh, what, what, what would you have me to do? Obviously, a threat has been issued against my life. Um, in this moment, there's a lot of things I could do. But what is your plan, Lord? Instead of waiting on the Lord to respond and to say, okay, this is what I want you to do, or this is what I don't want you to do, Elijah, he kind of you know, loses his mind for just a moment and starts thinking on his own terms on what he's going to do. And of course, uh, by default, he decides, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I'm running away. And so we get to verse 4, and it says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he noticed that he might die. It's like, brother, you done lost your mind. Come on. What's <laughs> happening here? Wake up, Elijah. But it says that he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father's. Hmm. Verse five, then as he laid, then as he laid and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Mm -hmm. And he looked and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he laid back down. Verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of of the food, 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. You know, I have to just make a note here that you can just notice God's patience here. Yeah. Notice God's patience and his goodness. Mm -hmm. Right here, God could have approached him already. Mm -hmm. In this moment where he's already began his running away journey, God could have approached him early on and said, hey, what are you doing? You know, uh, wake up. But he doesn't. In this case, he sends the angel and God's like, you know what? I already know where this brother's going. He's all headed over. God already knew he was headed to Mount Horeb before Elijah knew that's where he was going. Mm -hmm. And so God decided, look, I know this brother's going to pass out along the way. He's probably going to die. I got much more for him to do. And he sends one of his, hey, get down there and feed this, this, feed this child of mine uh, so that I can shake him and wake him up and let him know that I'm still with him. And so God provides for Elijah in this moment. And you, you would think, you know, if something might click in Elijah's mind, like, ah, oh, God's still with me. What am I doing? I shouldn't be running away. No, he's still fearful. And so he goes as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And then verse nine, and there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord, now God is coming. And the word of the Lord comes to him and says to him and, uh, and says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now God shows up and says, hey, 
what are you doing over here? Have you forgotten me? I'm over here. Have you forgotten what I just did back here? What are you doing here? And so God is trying to wake him up to the realization that, hey, man, you're rushing. You're, you're going way far. You have taken your own path, your own track. You, you, for, you have forgotten about my timing. You have forgotten about my perfect will. Wake up, man. I'm here for you. I'm still your God. I'm still the same God that was back there on the mountain with you. And the, and the lesson brings out that this story illustrates something important. When we rush, we can easily very easily find ourselves in the wrong place. Yeah. And of course, in Elijah's case, it was mm -hmm. his fear that caused him to be overwhelmed and rush into the desert, wishing that he had never been born. But there are other things that cause us to rush outside of God's plan for us. You know, all of us have a different, different traits, different things about us that really get us going. You know, it may not for us, it may not be fear. You know, some people may not be fearful, but rather, you know, I don't know, it may be uh, their temper. It may be uh, you know, whatever it may be. Every one of us are different in how we respond, but nonetheless, we must always wait on God. Yeah. God's will, His timing mm. is perfect. The lesson goes on to provide us other answers to support this, that Elijah isn't the only one. It's not like we're throwing Elijah under the bus. There are other people throughout the scripture mm. who also went into the situation where they find themselves in a situation in which they did not trust in God's perfect timing mm. and His plan. I'm gonna, can I give some assignments here real quick, some reading mm -hmm. assignments? Sure. Genesis chapter 16, Brother Denzi, Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. So that's Genesis 16, verses 1 through 3. Jill, Numbers chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. Numbers 20, 10 through 12. Uh, Shelly, if you could read Judges 14, verses 1 through 3. And James, if you could read uh, Luke chapter 9, yes, verses sir. 51 to 56. Oh, yeah. So we're going to come back to Brother Denzi. So this is Abraham and Sarah. Take it away, Pastor Denzi. Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then said Sarai, Abram's wife took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to his wife after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. God provides the promise they're going to rush it, right? Mm -hmm. Because of their ambition, they rushed on God's perfect timing and God's perfect plan. So there's an example in Abraham and Sarah. Now we come to Jill, Numbers chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Mm -hmm. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with mm -hmm. his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. God speaks to Moses and says, I want you to speak to this rock. Moses, because of his anger, he rushed the Lord's perfect timing, the Lord's perfect plan. In this case, of course, Moses is an example in this area. Now we come to Judges chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Samson, go ahead. Judges 14, 1. Now Samson went to Timnah, and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I've seen a woman in Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Mm. Mm. Okay, so in this instance, we see that Samson, his passion led him to rush God's plan. Mm -hmm. And so now our last one really quickly here, Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 51 to 56. All right, Luke 9, 51 to 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that... that that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went, and they entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though, as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what man manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to 
another village. Samson's passion, James and John's zeal led them to rush the Lord. And that's the whole point of this message, my friends, is that we need to be waiting patiently for the Lord's plan, mm -hmm. the Lord's timing, because it may lead us to go marry, uh, you know, the sons of God, marry the daughters of men mm -hmm. out of the will of the Lord. Or in this case, uh, our zeal and our passion cause us to act in a certain way that is not in accordance to God's will. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord always. He mm -hmm. will direct your path. Amen. 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 Great lesson, Waiting in the Crucible. I have Thursday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and it's entitled, Learning to Take Delight in the Lord. It's one of my favorite Bible verses. Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He will give thee the desires of thine heart. And of course, that was one of the promises that I and my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time, but my wife-to-be claimed. When we were dating and courting, we were claiming this promise, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. You know, it was just a very upbeat, happy, powerful promise in our lives. So the quarterly says, Psalm 37 verse 4 is a wonderful promise. Indeed it is. Imagine getting what you've always wanted. Yes, when I got my Reese, I got what I always wanted. But getting the desires of our hearts hinges on having a heart that takes delight in the Lord. Yeah. So what does it mean to take delight in the Lord? Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say, read Psalm 37, 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. The context for Psalm 37, 4 is perhaps a little surprising. David is writing about being surrounded by people who are working against God and against him. When people are working against us, the natural response is often to get angry or to set out to justify ourselves. But David advises something different. In other words, David is advising us to delight ourselves in the Lord mm -hmm. when we're going through all of these struggles and difficulties. Right. It's a completely different context than the one that I remember thinking when I was courting Risi, dating Risi. So let's just take a look at these verses. Psalm 37, the quarterly says, let's read verses 1 through 11. Let's just do that. Psalm 37, 1 through 11, fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut up down like the grass and with Wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as a light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man whose who brings wickedness to pass. Cease from anger, verse 8. Forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any ways to do evil. For evildoers, verse 9, shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. Mm -hmm. For yet a little while, verse 10, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, but the meek mm -hmm. shall inherit the earth. Mm -hmm and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Yeah. Right. Seems like that's what Jesus was quoting that's right. that's in right. Matthew chapter 5, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he was quoting it in Matthew chapter 5 in the context of the Jewish people being ruled by the Romans in a very negative way. You know, they wanted to be freed from the Romans and they wanted, you know, the Messiah to liberate them and to give them all the goods and the riches and the luxuries and the blessings that the Romans had. And they wanted to come out of this uh, bondage and captivity, so to speak. And Jesus refers them back to Psalm 37 in a way, in the context. And he says, you know, you guys shouldn't be fretting yourselves and worrying yourselves and troubling yourselves about these Romans or anyone else. You need to delight yourself also in the Lord. Mm -hmm. He's going to give you the desires of your heart. Your focus is off. When we focus on revenge, when we focus on self-justification, when we focus on seeking our righteousness, so to speak, our focus is off. God wants us to focus on Him. Right. He right. wants us to delight in Him. And you know, David, he had these moments, you know, where he was just delighting in the Lord, you know, and, and he found Saul in the cave and he's like, I'm not going to touch him. This is God's anointing, you know. And then he comes out of there and he has this experience, you know, where he wants to go and, and kill all of Nabal's, Nabal's men, you know, because mm -hmm. he didn't provide for him. And then he comes back and has that experience, you know, where he goes down and gets the sword in the bolster. And he's up there. He's like, he's on the heist. He's like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. And then he goes from there, you know, and he has the experience, you know, where he goes to the Philistines 
Philistines, right. you know, mm -hmm. to the enemies of God's people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so David has these positive experiences where he does exactly what God wants to do because he's delighting in the Lord. And then he has these other experiences where, you know, he goes to the priest at Nob and he lies and gets the sword and causes all of them to be slaughtered by Saul. And we have the same experiences. So often we yeah. fail to delight ourselves oh, in the so Lord true. and to focus in the Lord yeah. when we come to these difficult places and when the enemies come against us. Now, friends, just again, I want to I want to reference the book of Revelation, chapter 13, because that really is where we're headed. We're right. going to a time and a place yeah. where we are going to be completely surrounded. Jesus calls it the hour of temptation. Yeah. Wow. And he says he's going to deliver us from this hour of temptation, but the deliverance is not necessarily going to come in the way we think. It's not going to come in, oh, they're going to let you buy and sell after all. Oh, they're not going to do a death decree after all. Oh, after all, they're going to accept you into society. You're not going to be hated by all, all, of all nations for my <laughs> name's sake. No, 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 that's not the deliverance. The deliverance we're going to get is going to be a deliverance which causes us to delight ourselves in the Lord mm -hmm. in spite of the circumstances mm -hmm. that surround us. We're going to be shut in with God. We're going to be sealed with God. We're going to be settled. We can't be moved. And we're going to be praying, earnestly praying, all the way up until the close of probation. We're going to be praying, interceding mm -hmm. for our enemies, hoping that another soul will turn to the Lord, another heart will listen to the voice of God, of the Holy Spirit, another person will respond and find themselves mm -hmm. inside the kingdom at their very end of time because when we're in that city after the thousand years and we're looking out of that gray multitude like the sands of the sea we're not going to be saying see I told you I told you I'm sure you should have listened to me you should have listened to you should have come to that revelation we're going to be saying oh Lord I wish there was one more thing I could have done yeah. to save this person to save that one one more person yeah. if I would have just delighted more in the Lord right yeah. let's break this down it's really powerful when you look at a couple of these verses the first one verse one fret not that word means don't be angry. Don't be jealous. Don't have this zeal like the sons of thunder did, this right. zeal to call fire down from heaven. And don't be envious. So don't be jealous or envy. Don't waste time on it, right? Don't, don't have zeal for the cause of defending yourself. Sometimes right. you know, someone says something about you, I'm going to go, to, I'm just going to, and you spend all this time trying yeah. to defend yourself, you know, and defend. No, no, put your zeal on God's side. You've got a message to proclaim. You've got a witness to give. You've got work you need to do for the Lord. Don't be distracted. Jesus kept his focus mm -hmm. steadfast. He wasn't distracted by the, the, the treatment of the Samaritans. He was going steadfastly toward Jerusalem. Why? He was going to die for the Samaritans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to be tripped up by their rejection of him. He was going to be tripped up by the way they mistreated him. He wasn't going to let the disciples even convince him. Sometimes we have to actually say no to the people that are closest to us who want us to be justified, right? Mm. I mean, Peter was like, I'm going to defend you, Jesus. I'm going to be cutting some ears off here. You know, I'm going to be defending you. And we're like that. You know, the word of God is like a sword and we sharpen it up. You know, all our doctrines are in place. And then we start slicing people's ears off and we're like, I'm defending Christ. Look at me. Yeah. And we wonder why they don't seem to be able to hear what we're saying, right? right? We just cut their ears off. And Christ has to come up behind us and he has to put those ears back on so that people can hear. So that that's the point. Don't Amen. get distracted by the distractors. Don't get yeah. distracted by Satan. Don't get distracted by how he's working because God wants you to delight in him. There's so much to delight in in the Lord. So don't fret yourself. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious. Verse 5 says, commit, right? Commit. Verse 5, commit thy way unto the Lord. That means to roll, right? to roll it on God's shoulders, right? Commit it to God. Trust in God. He will work it out. He's got big shoulders. Job experienced the big shoulders of God, right? You know, we talk about his wife sometimes and we give her kind of a bad time, but man, you read, read the chapters from three on, on in to about 38 and read about what Job says there. He rolls it on God's shoulders. David rolls it on. Read some of the Psalms. David is angry but he's processing that anger. So when he gets in contact mm -hmm. with Saul, he's not going to take it out on Saul because he's already given it to God. God wants everything we've got and mm -hmm. he can take it all. Mm -hmm. He can take yes. all of it. Yes. And when we give it to God, you know how you feel when you talk about your frustrations with someone, you know, just, talk, just talk it out and you feel better, right? Mm -hmm. Well, God wants us to talk it out with him. Delight in the Lord. Talk it out with him. Let him have it. Roll it on him. Again, verse 7. Rest, right? Rest, rest in the Lord. That word actually means to be dumb, to stop, to perish. Like you're done. You're not going to say anything. You're going to let those bad thoughts perish. You're just going to, you're going to be done. You're not going to say a thing. Jesus was dumb before his enemies, right? Didn't say a word. Just don't even go there. The Lord will fight for you and you will do what? What's your part? Hold your peace. Be patient. Wait, fret not. Again, don't be angry. Don't be jealous. Don't be zealous in a negative way. 
Don't worry about those that are prospering, that are pushing their way forward, that are planning wicked devices, unusual wicked. See, slack and forsake, uh, loose and relinquish, just let go. Fret not yourself. Three times that phrase is used. Fret not yourself. Do not let anger lead you to evil doing. You are waiting in the crucible. You are waiting in the crucible by delighting in the Lord. I've got to read this. It's so powerful. David is repeating again and again in different ways. This is the quarterly. Trust God. Trust Him to act. Don't get upset because God is your God. He is working for you even right now. You mm -hmm. don't have to charge in. You don't have to try to sort things out for yourself. Your Father in Heaven is in charge. Trust Him. Trust Him completely. It is in this context yes. that David writes about taking delight in the Lord. To take delight in God means that we live in a state of perfect trust. Nothing can ruffle our peace because God is here at work and we can praise Him. We can even smile because because no, no one can outwit God. No one can outwit mm -hmm. God. I can be outwitted, you can be outwitted, we can be outwitted, but no one can outwit God. I love that. When we learn to do this, we really will receive what our hearts long for because we will receive what God, our loving Father, wants to give us at the time that most benefits us and His kingdom. Delight thyself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Wow. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. What a blessing this lesson has been and we hope you have been blessed, but we are not done yet. We want a final comment from each one of you, beginning with Sister Gio Morricone. Waiting goes against the natural heart. We want answers. We want to hurry up. We want to get out of that trial, but I just want to remind you, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He will strengthen your heart. Yes, and in, in Tuesday's lesson, we learned a lot from David. There's an object lesson in waiting. What the quarterly says, don't grab what God has not yet given. God's gifts are always best received from His hand and in His time. This may require a very long time of waiting, but then it says bean sprouts, grow up literally almost overnight, but an oak tree takes <laughs> many years. And when the strong wind comes, mm -hmm. the oak tree prevails. Amen. Amen. Inspired by Pastor Rafferty, don't go chopping them ears off. <laughs> Leave them ears alone. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him and in all, on all your ways, He will direct your path. Amen. Amen. The twin to Psalm 37 might be Psalm 73 where David is envious at the wicked and he's really frustrated until he goes into the sanctuary and then he sees their end. And then verse 23, he says, uh, not verse 23, who is it? Verse 25, whom have I in heaven but thee? Mm -hmm. And there is none upon earth that I desire beside mm -hmm. thee. Delight yourself in the Lord, desire him, and he will bring it to pass. Thank you so much, Pastor James Rafferty, Pastor Ryan Day, Sister Shelley Quinn, and Sister Gio Morricone. And this lesson was powerful. What a blessing it has been to look at these different aspects of waiting on the Lord. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, mm -hmm. to the person who searches for Him. So I encourage you to wait on the Lord. He will be good to you. He will bless you. Wait on the Lord and He will bless you. Next week, lesson number 12, dying like a seed. So we will be waiting for you here at 3ABN Sabbath School panel. The lesson continues. We'll see you next time. <laughs>